Hello, everyone, and welcome to ADI Analytics webinar on our outlook for oil and gas, energy and chemicals in 2017. My name is Tyler Wilson, and I'm an analyst at ADI Analytics, focusing primarily on natural gas monetization markets. I will be moderating this morning's webinar. If you wish, wish to ask a question, please type the question into the box on the right side of the screen, and I will read them during the question and answer session following our presentation. Today's presenter is Uday Taraga, founder and CEO of ADI Analytics. He started ADI Analytics in 2009, and before that worked for Booz Allen, ConocoPhillips, and ExxonMobil. He holds a PhD in fuel science from Penn State and an MBA from the University of Texas. I'm pleased to present today's speaker, Uday Taraga. Thank you, Tyler, um, and thank you to everybody who has joined us uh, this morning, taking some time out uh, to, to listen to our uh, thoughts and views. Um, for those of you who um, don't know a lot about us, we'll start with a very quick intro to the firm, and then we'll go into the um, topic for today's uh, presentation. Uh, very briefly, ADI is a, is a boutique consulting firm. We are based here in Houston. We focus exclusively on uh, oil and gas, energy, and chemicals. Uh, within those market segments, we work across the value chain. So if you take oil and gas, for example, we work on projects in upstream, midstream, and, and downstream markets as well. Uh, we have been around for the past uh, eight years. Uh, this is our ninth year in 2017. Um, over the last eight years, we have served over 100 clients and have completed uh, a little over 250 projects. Uh, we work with a wide range of clients, oil and gas majors like Exxon and Shell, ENP independents like ConocoPhillips and Santos, uh, similarly refining independents like Phillips 66. We also do a lot of work uh, with overseas uh, oil and gas companies and NOCs, a number of chemical companies, uh, companies like Honeywell and Dover who serve uh, the oil and gas industry through equipment and services. Uh, we do a lot of due diligence work for investors and finally a number of early stage uh, technology companies. Uh, clients usually come to us with specific problems uh, in and around market research, cost and economic analysis, uh, competitive intelligence and uh, strategic planning and, and we work on those projects uh, trying to uh, find solutions through primary and secondary research as well as proprietary models and analytics that we have built over the years. Um, in addition to consulting, uh, we offer subscription-based research products and services uh, and, and you can learn a little bit more about all of this on our website, uh, which is adi-analytics.com. Um, getting into today's discussion, uh, the idea here is to share uh, some thoughts and views of how we see the oil and gas, energy, and chemical industries uh, at the beginning of 2017 and how they are likely to evolve uh, in, in the near term. Um, we'll, uh, we've segmented today's presentation in, in five areas, uh, upstream oil and gas, uh, midstream and natural gas liquids, uh, refining and fuels, and uh, power and chemicals. Um, so we'll spend a little bit of time in, in each of these segments. Uh, just at a high level, I think we see uh, some uptick in upstream oil and gas. Uh, midstream and refining markets we think will stay stagnant uh, in, in the near term. Uh, we see some optimism uh, again for the uh, power market. Um, and finally, uh, chemicals I think is, is going to be fairly challenged uh, in, in the near term as it's coming off of uh, cycle high. Um, Diving a little bit deeper into each of these, um, the upstream oil and gas markets, uh, we see uh, some uh, activity and, and uh, optimism in, in, the, in these markets going forward, primarily driven by general expectation of stability around oil pricing. We anticipate oil prices to stabilize in the 50s, driven primarily by the OPEC deal, which will serve as some sort of a floor for prices. Um, now, of course, once prices do stabilize in the 50s for a while, we anticipate some of the uh, competitive North American shale plays to come back into action, which will serve as some sort of a ceiling for the market. So, so in general, there's plenty of oil that's being supplied, and I think the 50s is where uh, it's likely to stabilize given uh, the OPEC deal uh, that occurred late last year. 
In terms of natural gas, we anticipate supply to moderate a little bit, uh, but there is still plenty of natural gas uh, that's available, and uh, a significant amount of that is going to come into the market through LNG. We anticipate new LNG projects to be commissioned this year, and collectively the market, LNG market, is going to be oversupplied. Uh, we, we anticipate capital spending in upstream oil and gas to pick up a little bit, uh, but at the same time there's a significant amount of effort both uh, among operators as well as oil field service and equipment providers to innovate and find ways to optimize and cut costs. Uh, so I think we'll uh, see both of those uh, factors kind of competing with each other in, in the near term. So just uh, diving a little bit deeper into uh, each of these issues, um, if you aggregate all the different oil price estimates and outlooks out there, you'll see a pretty broad range going forward, uh, in general reflecting the, the fairly high levels of uncertainty around oil prices that's uh, out there in, in the markets. Uh, having said that, I think there that there is growing sentiment that prices will stabilize in the 50s. We at ADI certainly do uh, share that view. Uh, of course, there's uncertainty around how uh, how effectively will the OPEC deal stand, but uh, we think that there's enough momentum there, especially by Russia joining the uh, deal, for example, that uh, the 50s will serve as some sort of a floor for oil prices. Uh, now, of course, uh, North American shale plays, some of them are fairly competitive in the 50s, and that will have uh, some sort of a ceiling in terms of oil prices. Um, we talked a little bit about capital spending. We anticipate uh, capital spending in oil and gas to pick up a little bit into uh, you know, closer to around uh, $800 billion, uh, but it's coming off of uh, cycle highs that we saw. Uh, I'm sorry, but it's coming off of cycle lows that we saw over the last couple of years as capital spending has declined significantly. Um, so, so while there is some optimism uh, here uh, in terms of capital spending, we are going to be uh, several years away from the cycle highs uh, around capex that we saw in uh, 13 and 14. Now, looking at LNG markets, uh, this chart shows uh, demand for LNG in a couple of cases, in some, in the base case, in the high case, those are the blue and gray bars, uh, and then you have supply, which is the orange line. And you'll see that in general, the expectation is that the global LNG market will be oversupplied in in the near term, likely through uh, 2025. Uh, we have a we have a few LNG projects that are coming on stream. Uh, this year as well. So collectively, there's going to be uh, an uptick in uh, LNG supply while demand continues to struggle uh, for various reasons, primarily because of slowing emerging economies and lackluster economic growth in some of the largest uh, LNG consumers. So the implications in terms of the outlook for LNG export projects is fairly mixed here in North America. The first wave of projects, uh, which are represented by those green circles at the top right, I think they will continue uh, to move forward. Um, this chart here segments the entire landscape of North American LNG projects based on uh, their uh, likelihood of uh, achieving commercial success. Um, so the axis on the, the x-axis is some uh, estimate of the time it will take for these projects to come to market. It's a function of where they are in the construction process as well as the regulatory approvals process. And the y-axis uh, estimates uh, competitiveness of the project either in terms of capital cost or their ability to uh, have uh, negotiated offtake agreements. So collectively, I think the first wave of projects is well said. The second wave of projects, which is reflected in that orange uh, circles in the center, I think the outlook for them is going to be mixed and, and they're going to probably struggle given the oversupplied LNG market in, in the near term. Um, innovation is definitely playing a pretty big role, much uh, bigger role than a lot of players have anticipated in the industry. Um, if you look at the four major plays, for example, uh, shale plays in North America, Barkin, Eagleford, Marcellus, and Permian, uh, across multiple metrics, whether it is drilling costs, completion costs, or operating expenses, for example, 
we have seen a reduction in these costs on a normalized basis, whether you look at it per foot, per lateral, or on a per barrel basis. Um, we have at the same time seen improvements in some of the key revenue metrics, for example, around uh, EURs. Uh, so collectively, well costs are going down, uh, well productivity is rising. Um, a lot of these are happening uh, through multiple factors. Some of it is, of course, uh, discounts that oil field service companies have offered, uh, but uh, some of it is also through innovation and optimization of the various processes that these players are uh, using uh, in, in their operations. Uh, so collectively, I think the competitiveness, the cost competitiveness of North American shale plays is improving and that uh, will continue to have an impact in terms of new supply uh, as well as overall uh, oil supply and demand markets. Um, you know, we'll talk next about midstream and NGLs. Uh, I do want to uh, say that please uh, feel free to submit your questions at this point of time uh, through the uh, questions option that's available through the GoToWebinar app. Uh, we uh, look forward to uh, addressing all of those questions later during this uh, presentation. Uh, focusing on midstream and NGLs, uh, we finally see some moderation of NGL production and supply here in North America. Um, a lot of that is, of course, driven by the overall moderation that we have seen uh, in drilling in, in the various shale plays. Um, demand, uh, the demand side of NGLs uh, has benefited primarily from exports. We will continue to see exports in particular of LPG as well as ethane starting this year uh, and, and that will continue uh, to help the demand uh, side of the NGL equation. And then finally we anticipate a couple of crackers to the ethane crackers producing ethylene for downstream chemical derivatives they're going to start up this year and that will all collectively contribute uh, to uh, additional demand for NGLs. Um, having said that, uh, midstream capex will continue to stagnate. I think in the near term, this is uh, primarily driven by significant uh, overinvestment in uh, pipeline and gas processing capacity. So I think in general, from a capex point of view, midstream and NGLs is probably going to be uh, quite slow. Um, we see that on, on this particular page here where uh, we are essentially anticipating a very marginal reduction or some sort of a stagnation in capital spending on a global basis around midstream uh, markets uh, going forward. Um, in terms of supply, uh, while there is a significant amount uh, of additional uh, supply that is uh, coming on uh, stream in the near future, uh, we are seeing uh, some of that uh, slowing uh, down, primarily driven by overall uh, uh, slowdown in uh, shale production. Uh, I'm sorry, overall slowdown in uh, oil and gas drilling in the North American shale plays. Uh, but in spite of that, we see that NGL production will rise at a fairly robust pace by as much as 25% uh, through 2020. So collectively, all of this has had a pretty significant impact in the North American trade flow picture for, North America, for uh, NGLs. Um, historically, a lot of NGLs would find their way into uh, the East Coast, uh, but thanks to Marcellus and Utica, uh, we have seen significant growth in NGL production and supply on the East Coast, and a lot of that is finding its way into the Gulf Coast and then eventually being exported uh, to overseas markets. Uh, and of course, now with the new ethane crackers coming on stream, uh, some of that production would be uh, converted into uh, ethylene. In terms of uh, midstream capacity, uh, the industry has invested in, in over a hundred pipeline projects. Uh, when you include projects uh, that are likely to come on stream by the end of the decade and collectively uh, the market is oversupplied in terms of pipe as well as in terms of gas processing capacity. Uh, what this chart here shows uh, is just uh, incremental uh, supply growth in NGLs uh, or through uh, 
2020 and where the existing evacuation capacity is. And, and you'll see that uh, there's significant amount uh, of existing pipe that will have to be filled in any moderation in uh, this incremental uh, supply growth uh, would actually lead to a significant amount of pipeline capacity that is underutilized. Uh, moving on to refining and fuels, um, 2016 was a relatively difficult year for the industry uh, having come off of a very strong year in 2015, uh, but crack spreads uh, have, have struggled in 2016 and, and we anticipate that uh, that struggle to continue in uh, 2017. Uh, a lot of this is driven primarily because of higher crude oil prices, especially Brent, uh, to which a lot of crack spreads are indexed and uh, to which a lot of uh, refiners are exposed to. Uh, so in, in particular, for example, if you take a look at refiners in Pad 1 on the East Coast, a lot of their crude oil pricing is indexed to Brent and Brent pricing has uh, been a little bit more robust than, say, uh, WTI and collectively uh, that has increased feedstock costs. Uh, simultaneously, a lot of the key product markets are oversupplied uh, and as a result, uh, uh, fuel prices have come down and, and collectively that has pressurized and impacted uh, crack spreads, refining margins uh, on, on a global basis. The, in terms of near-term challenges, access to high-octane blend stocks is, is one of the major challenges for the industry. I think um, that is uh, driven by multiple factors and, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but that in many ways is one of the major operational challenges for the refining industry. Uh, in terms of players who are likely to succeed, it is becoming increasingly clear that uh, refiners who went out and acquired uh, midstream assets or beefed up their product trading and, and feedstock trading capabilities, uh, they are better positioned uh, to improve their margins uh, in this environment where uh, the pressure on the feedstock side as well as the product side is uh, rising pretty significantly. Diving a little bit deeper, we anticipate uh, some uh, moderate marginal reduction in capital spending in refining in the near term. Uh, the current spending levels have been a little over $90 billion annually. We anticipate that to come down to somewhere in the low 80s. Uh, and, and essentially that's driven primarily by what we are seeing uh, around the declining uh, refining margins. Um, the crude oil prices, uh, the, the collapse in crude oil prices uh, has had an impact on overall uh, fuel pricing. Uh, this is just a U.S. Uh, picture. If you look at uh, similar data for Europe, for example, the reductions have been much more primarily because they're also struggling with uh, an oversupply across some of their key product markets. However, uh, what has been interesting to uh, observe during this time frame is how uh, the value of an octane barrel has increased uh, pretty significantly over the last few years. Um, the octane barrel is nothing but the difference uh, between uh, premium and regular gasoline uh, on a barrel basis, uh, but also normalized uh, per uh, octane number. So, so the typical difference between a premium gasoline formulation and a regular uh, gasoline blend is about four octane points, so that has been factored in uh, here as well. But essentially the spread has increased pretty dramatically uh, over the last two years. Um, this is driven by multiple factors, uh, one of which uh, is uh, uh, g growing exports, uh, uh, gasoline uh, exports have grown pretty significantly. Um, that is reflected uh, in a somewhat indirect fashion here by the decline in imports that we have uh, seen within uh, North America. The other big driver that has had an impact on uh, this, uh, on, on the rise of the octane barrel has been the increasing amount of light tide oil that has been blended. Light tide oil uh, compositionally has, produces uh, refined products with a lower octane value and a lot of the uh, capacity, uh, processing refining capacity that is required to convert those low octane blend stocks into higher octane blend stocks 
uh, is not available as readily as it was uh, in the past. Collectively, that's the reason why we see a pretty big surge in demand for Octane, and we anticipate that to continue in, in the near future. Um, this demand for Octane is going to have an impact in terms of uh, new investments. So if you take a look at um, uh, gasoline imports by PAD, which is the chart in the center, um, you will see that the bulk of the imports of gasoline and finished gasoline as well as blended gasoline uh, is coming into PAD 1 on the East Coast. Uh, interestingly, East Coast is also where you see uh, a lot of NGL capacity, in particular C3 and C4. Um, so it is possible that there may be opportunities uh, for refiners as well as midstream players to produce high octane, high octane blend stocks outside the refinery at midstream gas, uh, midstream gas and NGL processing facilities and then blend those high octane uh, components into finished gasoline uh, formulations, either at terminals or at uh, refineries. So this shift that we are seeing in terms of demand for high octane components coupled with the availability of feedstocks that allow you to produce high octane blend stocks creates opportunities for both refining as well as midstream players to develop new opportunities uh, and, and uh, um, new business development uh, investments. Finally, I think um, the issues around fuel octane will continue uh, well beyond 2020 uh, because of multiple factors. We talked a little bit about uh, the limited octane reforming capacity uh, that refiners have access to these days. Um, some of the other factors include limits on the volume of ethanol that can be blended. We are already at uh, uh, some sort of a blend wall for ethanol blending. And it's unlikely that's going to change. In addition, the world is awash in light nafta, and uh, light nafta traditionally has a lower octane number relative to some of the other blend stocks. Uh, and then finally, the U.S. Uh, will start implementing lower sulfur tier 3 regulations that require reduction in gasoline sulfur from 30 ppm to 10 ppm. And collectively, that's going to have uh, an impact uh, on, on fuel octane. So a lot of the uh, issues that we see, the big spread that we see between premium and regular gasoline right now is anticipated to continue well into the midterm as well. Moving on to the power section, um, again, uh, if, if there are questions, we welcome them through the uh, chat option on the software. Um, in, in terms of uh, the power markets, there is clearly a lot of expectations that the new presidential administration will have an impact uh, in power, especially around coal. Uh, our general assessment is that uh, in spite of these expectations, these, the, the extent of the impact is going to be uh, limited, um, and, and we can talk a little bit more about that. But, but in general, uh, there's a pretty strong shift away from coal towards natural gas, uh, and the fundamental costs and economics are much more advantaged to a natural gas-based power generation, which is why it, it uh, continues to grow. Um, and, and then finally, we are seeing rapid advances, rapid strides in uh, new technology and innovation, particularly around uh, energy storage, uh, which will have an impact on the overall power market, uh, more likely in the near term uh, and, and the mid term. In, in terms of capital spending, uh, we anticipate uh, uh, you know, spending in the power industry, capital spending in the power industry to continue at somewhat similar rates that we have seen in the uh, historical past. Uh, now, there is the chance that if there are dramatic changes in policy, we might see some changes. If there's significant uh, impetus to new infrastructure spending, as uh, the new presidential administration has suggested, this might uh, have an impact on capital spending. But in general, in the near term, we think that the power industry will continue at its traditional pace of uh, growth uh, from a capex point of view. Um, in, in terms of uh, 
you know, power generation as a function of uh, fuel, um, you know, natural gas has, has made pretty significant strides uh, since uh, the shale plays uh, gained their commercial success in, in the late 2000s. Uh, and and uh, the share of electricity that is generated in the U.S. Uh, by, from natural gas has increased steadily from a little uh, below a quarter of overall generation to as much as uh, a third. So there has been significant growth uh, in uh, natural gas based power generation. A lot of this is driven by the surplus natural gas that's available at very competitive rates as well as the fact that bringing in new natural gas fired power generation capacity is much quicker and much more cost effective than let's say uh, a new coal-fired power plant. And then finally, of course, there have been pretty st stringent regulations on the coal-fired uh, uh, power generation segment uh, that has significantly impacted uh, the industry. Coal has essentially lost a third of its market share over the last uh, five years uh, as natural gas-based power generation has essentially replaced a lot of that uh, capacity. In, in terms of new innovation, again, we see interesting opportunities, especially around distributed power generation, which we think is an area that is growing fairly quickly. Um, in general, uh, if you look at it in, from, uh, in terms of capacity additions, which is the chart on the left, uh, we anticipate a significant amount of new capacity to be brought on stream on a distributed basis. Um, the charts on the right essentially show growth rates. You'll see that distributed power generation capacity is growing at a much higher uh, rate than any of the other existing uh, incumbent or competing options. Uh, a lot of this power generation capacity is increasingly being facilitated by natural gas uh, as well as uh, significant improvements in uh, energy storage costs. If you look at uh, energy storage costs and, and you look at the different options that are available, in general we see reductions in uh, the cost of energy storage across the board. So for example, if you take lithium-ion batteries, we anticipate as much as 50% cost reduction over the next uh, four, three, four years. And, and that's just continuing the trajectory of cost reduction that we have seen over the past uh, three or four years. We, we see similar cost reductions across some of the other uh, energy storage options as well. So I, I think collectively we do think that energy storage is going to have a pretty disruptive impact on the overall uh, power generation segment. Finally, uh, moving on to chemicals. Uh, chemicals, I think, is, is, has struggled and will continue to struggle over the near term for multiple reasons. Um, the chemicals industry, from a growth point of view, is very closely tied to the emerging economies uh, because that's where it's, a lot of its products end up. The emerging economies have all been uh, struggling with uh, economic growth over the last few years. The outlook continues to be mixed, uh, and, and collectively all of that is having a pretty big impact on the chemical industry. Um, some of the segments, especially automobile sector as well as housing, have uh, started registering higher growth rates, which will offer some relief to the chemical industry. But in general, the industry uh, is also hampered with significant overcapacity uh, that will collectively drive consolidation as well as uh, slow growth uh, across the industry segment. Uh, in, in terms of capital spending, we see significant reductions going forward, primarily because the industry is coming off of cycle highs. Uh, we think that capital spending by will, will fall by as much as seven percent, six to seven percent, on an annualized basis through 2020, um, and and uh, th that's going to have an impact in uh, a wide range uh, of uh, segments. Um, in the near term, uh, we do anticipate uh, that uh, new capacity uh, that will be brought on stream, which will be at a slower rate than what we have seen in the past, will uh, follow the feedstock and to a large extent will uh, leverage feedstock availability in North America, um, both on the natural gas side as well as the NGL side. So I think we will see significant 
uh, or at least uh, moderate to significant levels of investment that will be focused around taking natural gas and converting it into, for example, methanol or ammonia, as well as new NGL conversion options, whether it is uh, ethane cracking or exports or uh, other uh, end users for C3 and C4 streams. Finally, uh, another headwind for the chemical industry is, is the slowing rate of innovation. If you look at the number of new materials and molecules that have been invented historically over time, uh, the number has decreased pretty significantly in, in the near past. And uh, more uh, worryingly, the uh, economic impact associated from the recent discoveries has not been as big as we have seen in the past. Uh, so, so collectively, there are multiple headwinds that are impacting the chemical industry, uh, which will make it uh, fairly challenge, uh, which will make it a fairly challenging place to be in the in the next uh, few years. So, with that, uh, trying to wrap up uh, here once again, uh, you know, upstream we think uh, is is uh, we have a fairly optimistic view for upstream in, in the near future, but again, uh, optimistic from where we are, uh, which is significant declines in capital spending over the last couple of years, but we anticipate some growth in 2017. Um, midstream uh, and refining markets we think will be stagnant or uh, decline marginally uh, f from a capital spending point of view. Uh, power, I think, will continue to grow at its, at its historical growth rates, and finally, chemicals will be fairly challenged going forward. So, with that, uh, you know, uh, we'll we'll take a pause here and uh, address any uh, comments or questions uh, that uh, may have come through. Uh, please feel free to submit additional comments and questions through the uh, questions window that's available. Hi everybody, uh, this is Tyler Wilson. Um, thank you for your questions and uh, please feel free to uh, continue to ask them. Um, the, there should be a box on the right side of your screen where you can uh, submit a question. Uh, we have several questions here so we'll, we'll get started. Um, first question, uh, why have or why has LNG or why has the LNG demand projection changed from this time last year? Uh, so I think um, it's, it's primarily driven by a slowdown in, in some of the major emerging economies, right? I mean, if you look at LNG uh, demand growth, a lot of that demand growth is coming from the emerging economies and some of the largest consumers, whether it is in Asia or increasingly some parts uh, of, of the Middle East, a lot of them are not growing at the economic, uh, their economies are not growing as rapidly uh, as they have in the past. And, and uh, that's, that's essentially having a pretty big impact on uh, you know, local energy demand, regional energy demand, and therefore demand for uh, LNG. Um, another important thing is that the new demand that we are seeing for LNG is increasingly fragmented. Um, so this fragmentation of demand growth in LNG, which is also a trend that we see in other energy segments, uh, means that uh, in order to sell out, let's say, an LNG export terminal, you need many more customers than you did historically. And that collectively also has an impact uh, on, on overall demand because uh, every time there's a, there's a country or a customer or region that decides to source LNG, they have to make some capital investments in regas terminals. Um, and, and it's difficult to make those uh, capital investments for all the different players that would be interested in sourcing LNG. So, so collectively, there are multiple factors, uh, which, which uh, is why LNG demand has slowed uh, in, in, in the last year or so. How do you view the market for LNG and CNG field vehicles and heavy equipment? I think uh, we see um, uh, 
significant opportunity for uh, small and mid-scale LNG value chains um, driven primarily by uh, the use of LNG as a fuel for marine fuels. Um, uh, marine fuels uh, are under regulatory pressure and they, uh, the, the fleet is looking at alternative options uh, and, and LNG is increasingly becoming uh, viable. We see much more uh, adoption for uh, LNG as a marine fuel uh, in uh, Europe, for example, as well as uh, China. Uh, in, in terms of LNG for heavy duty trucking or, or for that matter even CNG for automobile vehicles, we are fairly pessimistic. We don't see a lot of opportunities there. Now having said that, uh, you know, we have seen uh, alternative fuels such as methanol also uh, gain traction, especially in the marine market. Uh, and, and so I think as the regulatory pressure and compliance uh, picks up uh, you know, we will see, um, you know, some sort of competition between LNG and methanol as well as low sulfur diesel and eventually uh, fuels that are best positioned from a cost point of view as well as from an infrastructure point of view uh, uh, are uh, going to uh, have an advantage. But, but we do think that in the near term, the best opportunity for LNG from a fueling point of view is in the marine fuels market. What is your forecast for natural gas pricing? Um, I think, you know, if you, if you look at the North American natural gas uh, resource plays, there's uh, close to, uh, you know, uh, one and a half trillion cubic feet of uh, natural gas that's available in, uh, uh, across all the plays. We do think that uh, anywhere from two-thirds to three-fourths of that capacity can be uh, made available at less than three to four dollars a million BTU. Um, so now, now in addition to that, there's a significant amount of capacity as much as uh, 25 to 30 percent of the total natural gas resource base that is essentially associated gas. So, so its economics are increasingly becoming independent of the pricing of natural gas and are increasingly tied to the economics associated with oil pricing. Um, so, so, there's a, so, so a lot of that capacity could be made available at costs that are much lower. So, so collectively, right, I know we do think that natural gas in North America is going to be available um, well through the medium to long term at less than uh, $4 a million BTU um, with, with a significant amount of production available at as low as $3 a million BTU. Do you think the Tier 3 uh, regulations will be canceled by the new administration? I think it is unlikely that um, Tier 3 regulations uh, will be impacted by changes uh, in, in regulatory policy, uh, primarily because uh, I think it is much further along and uh, also a lot of the uh, uh, arguments that have led to the Tier 3 regulations have been uh, influenced by their impact on enabling new automobile technologies. Um, so, so I think uh, if, if, if one looks at how, uh, you know, overall uh, employment might be impacted by uh, some of these regulations, I think Tier 3 might help downstream, uh, uh, I'm sorry, may help the automobile markets and, and that may uh, be another factor that would probably be considered. So I think given how further along Tier 3 is, as well as some of the larger uh, impacts associated with uh, Tier 3, especially on the automobile industry, I think it's unlikely that we will see them uh, being canceled by the new administration. You mentioned the role of, uh, of innovation in cutting costs for upstream companies. Is that moving fast enough to cut costs? 
Um, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, there is no better environment for uh, accelerating the rate of innovation and commercializing new technologies than when pri oil prices are low. And, and we have seen that very clearly uh, here in uh, North America. Uh, I mean, if you take the average drilling rig um, and, and you uh, looked up uh, historically how much oil is produced uh, by a new oil rig, let's say that was running for a month or so, in, in 2010, the incremental oil production from an oil rig that was running for a month would be around 150 to 200 barrels per day of capacity. Today, that same rig is doing as much as 500 to 600 barrels per day. So that's a 4x increase within uh, four or five years. Um, that's, that's driven by uh, new technologies like walking rigs, uh, multi-well pads, uh, the electrification, the shift towards AC rigs, um, more precise motors that allow you to stay in the pay zone more effectively for longer periods of time. Um, so, and, and that's just one example. We see similar innovations in the LNG value chain, for example. You know, the first floating LNG uh, plant uh, is, is out there. Petronas' uh, floating LNG facility is anticipated to start shipping LNG, first LNG cargoes uh, here pretty quickly. We are seeing significant innovations in uh, FSRUs. Uh, floating storage uh, regas units uh, that are significantly reducing the cost of uh, regasification for LNG. So um, I, I, I think that uh, the oil and gas industry is innovating at a much faster pace uh, driven by uh, low oil prices and driven by the pressure on improving its, uh, the efficiency of its capital. Uh, dollars and, and collectively I think uh, it's, it's having an impact both on the supply side as well as the cost of that new supply. Uh, we have several questions on oil field services um, you know, given that a lot of the attendees are from uh, EMP and oil field service companies. Uh, where do you see the uh, uh, oil field service costs going? So um, I mean uh, so clearly in the last couple of years there have been significant reductions in pricing that oil field service companies have offered for their products and services uh, primarily to maintain uh, some uh, revenue flow, some cash flow for their operations in a fairly distressed environment. Uh, we think that uh, a lot of those price discounts are going to moderate in the near term. Uh, but they are not going to go away entirely. Um, segments that I think will see some uh, price increases uh, in, in the near future include uh, the cost of uh, sand and propane, for example. We anticipate that to pick up here fairly quickly. We anticipate uh, day rates for drilling rates uh, to also pick up here uh, significantly. And then finally, the completions value chain within uh, oil and within uh, ENP is also uh, going to see some fairly, uh, we'll see an uptick in, in pricing, you know, the frack pumps as well as other services and tools that are used in completing oil and gas wells. I think we will see pricing there pick up here uh, quickly as well. So I think collectively, right, when I look at the oil field services segment, those are the three areas where I see prices to pick up uh, the cost of prop in. Uh, day rates for drilling rigs and, and finally uh, completion value chain related products and services. <clears throat> what impact will higher oil prices have on the backlog of drilled but uncompleted wells in 2017? So I think um, a lot of the uh, inventory of uh, drilled but uncompleted wells or docks uh, is, is, has already flown through the system. It wasn't as if there was uh, a very large inventory. Uh, if you look, if you compare the amount, the number of docks that were out there to the number of wells that are drilled, um, uh, you know, on average it's, it's still a fairly small number. So um, uh, also at any given point or time, given that shale drilling is a sequential process, there's always a certain number of wells that are in the hopper or that are in the inventory, if you will. 
so I think that is uh, the, the number of ducks that were out there were just a little bit higher than what a typical uh, inventory estimate might look like. So I think a lot of the existing ducks are going to be uh, are, are nearing completion or uh, will be completed here pretty quickly. Uh, can you comment on the outlook for rigs in 2017, uh, particularly in the Permian? So yeah, I mean, so that's a good question. Um, uh, you know, it's, nothing grounds the oil and gas industry uh, more quickly and uh, effectively than estimates around uh, the number of rigs out there. Uh, we do think that the rig count uh, should rise up uh, to the 800s, 900s by the end of 2017. Um, clearly, some players are going to see the bulk of that over over others. Uh, you know, we, uh, we we think that Permian will attract a significant chunk of uh, rig additions uh, over the uh, near term and, and the mid term in 2017. I think in general, we would say that Permian rig count should be around 100, 125 or so uh, by uh, the end of the year. Uh, can you uh, can you describe the role of both uh, operational optimizations and new technologies in uh, in uh, upstream unconventionals, and also uh, maybe highlight some of the major advances in each? Um, yeah, sure. So I think um, if if you look at the some of the cost reduction research that we have done in unconventionals, uh, we have been tracking unconventional costs over the last uh, five to uh, seven years uh, across multiple plays, across multiple basins, and we have tried to correlate that to new technology, new innovations uh, uh, within the oil and gas industry. And what we have found is that a lot of the cost reductions are not necessarily driven by brilliant new ideas that people have come to market, that, are, that people have brought to the market, but are more driven by uh, very clever uh, and, and still incredibly valuable optimization of existing operations. Um, because unconventionals uh, uh, was the new technology that achieved commercial deployment very quickly and, and achieved widespread commercial deployment, uh, there was a lot of room to optimize that and, and the unconventional oil and gas industry has done a terrific job of squeezing out uh, inefficiencies and redundancies within that process and have optimized the process. So I think a lot of the cost reductions that you have seen are driven by uh, that optimization, that injection of efficiency into the value chain, into, the, uh, in, into their operations. Now having said that, I think uh, the room for further cost reductions through optimization is increasingly running out and unconventional players are now increasingly focusing their time and attention on new innovations, whether it is uh, a shift towards uh, engineered completions, towards fit for purpose rigs and equipment, or towards, let's say, better imaging and seismic tools that allow them to understand where the fractures are sited and how the fractures are interacting with each other. So, so those fundamental innovations are uh, also uh, coming down the pike here. Uh, but I think that is that will drive the next wave of cost reductions versus optimization, which drove the bulk of the cost reduction over the last five years. What are some of the ramifications of the GE and Baker Hughes uh, deal? Um, I think um, it's it's a bit too early to say because uh, while there uh, are a lot of uh, areas where there are very clear and obvious synergies, there are also a number of places where um, there is a significant difference. Uh, for example, a lot of GE's product portfolio is focused on uh, offshore and, and subsea applications, while a lot of the growth opportunities, at least uh, in the near past, have been all onshore. So I think there are some areas where it's not quite clear how that picture will, uh, how, how the merged uh, companies will impact the industry collectively. 
uh, but but just at a high level, uh, you know, it is obvious that there uh, are uh, some areas of synergy, the collective uh, combination of uh, product uh, expertise with uh, service expertise uh, should be uh, a compelling value proposition, uh, but we'll actually have to see how it actually evolves uh, uh, and, and gets executed. Okay, we have our uh, last uh, kind of a two-part question here. Um, part one is, do you see any impact on refinery operations due to shale oil? And um, part two of that question is, uh, how would potential changes in the renewable fuel standard, uh, say a repeal, impact refiners? So, uh, so clearly we have already seen significant impact in refining operations from the use of light tight oil or shale oil, right? I mean, uh, a significant fraction of the feedstock in North American refineries is now uh, light tight oil. And the refiners have gone ahead and changed uh, and, and implemented infrastructure that's capable of processing this light tight oil. Uh, across their refining value chain, right from uh, sourcing and storage down to the way they run their core unit operations, whether it is distillation, FCC, or some of their hydro processing and, and other deep conversion equipment. In, in general, light tide oil is much lighter than the heavy crude oil that a lot of the North American refining infrastructure had uh, uh, geared up to process. And, and as a result, um, you know, a lot of the uh, gasoline uh, processes, whether it is naphtha reforming, isomerization, or alkylation, have been de-emphasized, or the industry had moved away from that capacity uh, over uh, the last 15 to 20 years. Um, you know, if, if you go and look at our blog, uh, you can see some specific uh, work that we have done in that area. Um, but, but coming to the point, I think the refining industry has has started processing a lot of this light tight oil and is finding that it will have to either make some investments or adjustments in order to address some of the challenges associated with processing this light tight oil, especially around uh, octane. In regard to the renewable fuel standard, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not quite clear what the new administration is going to do. Um, there's a pretty big industry that has spawned itself uh, based on the renewable fuel standard. A number of refiners have co-opted themselves into the renewable fuels industry as well by buying ethanol producers. So it's not quite clear whether a, repeal, uh, whether a repeal of the RFS would uh, be welcomed by the industry as such, uh, but definitely a relaxation of requirements around some of the uh, advanced uh, biofuels would probably be welcomed by the industry, primarily because the uh, cellulosic biofuel, the cellulosic ethanol industry has really struggled uh, in order to produce the volumes that uh, have been mandated by the renewable fuel standard. So, so I think um, there s s s an, uh, another issue that I think refiners would probably welcome some relief or some adjustment around is uh, RINs and, and because the cost of RINs has become, has become a fairly difficult uh, obligation uh, requirement for refiners and, and clearly some clarification or modification of RFS there would probably help the refining industry. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much Uday for uh, answering the questions of our, uh, of our attendees this morning. Thank you very much uh, and again I want to thank everybody who participated in this uh, webinar today. Uh, we uh, have uh, more events coming up. Uh, in particular we have uh, the 2017 North American Natural Gas Monetization Forum which is a one-day conference that ADI is organizing on February 28th in Houston. Um, we welcome all our attendees. Uh, to join this event. 30% uh, discount will be offered to all webinar attendees. We'll follow up uh, with you via email on that. Um, and we have upcoming webinars as well. Uh, every quarter we should, uh, we plan to organize a webinar and we welcome you to participate in those. Um, thank you for your participation here today.